Good all my friends over here in India and good evening to all those uh, alumni and the guests from the United States of America. Welcome to this 90th episode of our Continuing Medical Education Program being conducted by Andhra Medical College in Shakhapatnam for the 90th time uninterrupted. So we are, this being an important milestone, we have a very important guest today to speak to us. We've been waiting for him since long that um, uh, Ajay Noka has been busy for the last maybe four weeks or so, but I'm very glad that Pramohan could get him ultimately. We have been very eager to listen to him. And this being a very important um, milestone, it's very appropriate to have him for this episode. And uh, I thank Dr. Ram Mohan and Dr. Sridhar Chirumuri for having uh, uh, taken up this Herculean task of conducting these meetings week after the week. And thanks to Dr. Ravi Sharma for introducing Dr. Ajay Nuka. And uh, without wasting much time, I would wish uh, that we should start this program by introduction of the speaker by Dr. Ram Mohan. Dr. Ram Mohan, please go ahead. Ram Mohan, you are muted. Ram Mohan, you are not audible. Yeah. yeah, you can. Uh, you have to start all over. Yeah. So, so I'd, without uh, spending any time uh, beyond what you said, I want to thank Dr. Sharma for introducing Dr. Nuka to us. I didn't realize he was such a young fellow until I started reading his resume. And Dr. Sudhakar, a couple of times, hinted to me, "Can you find speakers who are qualified, knowledgeable, understand what's going on in COVID?" that are of uh, Indian origin, Andhra's, maybe AMC graduates. So I constantly search for one, but I don't think I could have found a greater qualified, more accomplished young man with such an extraordinary accomplishments already in the last 15 years than Ajay Nuka. So Ajay graduated in 1999 from Andhra Medical College after internship came here to the United States and did a master's in public health in Texas, then did a residency in internal medicine, a fellowship in um, hematology and oncology, and has been on the faculty at Emory University. Now, up to that point, that kind of story is quite common. But over the next 15 years, this man has done remarkable work. And I understand he is heavily, heavily involved in many research projects, international travel, consulting in many, many locations, while being extraordinarily productive, academically, publishing-wise. So when I first spoke to him, we discussed about what's going on in uh, this particular forum and what kind of information that he could give us, especially in relation to the topic that he's going to address with us today. I also briefed him that uh, he will give a formal presentation, but we might be asking him a lot of questions. So, Ajay, without spending too much time me talking, I want you to talk. So, take it. You, you would be, did you want to check, uh, to share the screen, but I want uh, Dr. Sharma to say a word before you begin. Ravi. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ram Mohan. So it gives me great pleasure to talk about Ajay and also about Emory. When uh, my wife and I got there in 1976, uh, we had one Indian faculty, Dr. Bhagirath Majumdar, who was a professor of pathology there. And people like me were not particularly very well known in the community because they were not used to they were still asking us when we say we are Indian, where we are Cherokee Indians. So they did not have a good idea about people from India migrating to South. Uh, things changed a lot. Right now, the provost for Emory University is a, is a Telugu gentleman. And uh, the dean of the medical school is an Indian gentleman. The chairman of the Department of uh, Oncology is an Indian gentleman. The uh, division director for oncology is an Indian gentleman. But it's nothing to say, it's nothing to brag about Indians, but how diversified 
and well appreciative of all the intellectual contributions of people, whether they come from what country, it doesn't matter. That's how much Emory has grown over the last 40, 50 years. And so, and then uh, when I came across huh? Ajay, he was, uh, I came to know about him only when he was starting as a faculty member at um, Emory in myeloma section. I made use of his expertise so much during the years I was at Emory and my entire private practice at that time were very appreciative of uh, him uh, and other people in the division of uh, myeloma department, myeloma section. Ajay, I'm going to ask you one question. This is not yours, but Molirpur, the drug that is now making head, uh, headlines all over the world from Merck, oral, uh, COVID-19 treatment actually is an Emory product that is licensed to these companies. I don't know if you or Carlos Del Rio are involved in any of the clinical trials that have been conducted, but if you want to at some point make a reference to that, if, if that is something in your area of interest, we'll be very happy to know about that too. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Sarbas. So one of the disclaimers I was about to make was <laughs> I, I'm not an infectious disease person, but how I got involved with, with some of these COVID trials is what I wanted to make a case first. Like, how did I get, get involved with this? So I'll start with my presentation and go with my story. So this is how I started in 94. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kairam, for uh, giving that introduction of where exactly I started and, and, and where I was. So where my turning point of where I learned about myself, more about how I wanted to pursue my career or, or where I wanted to end up in life is, is my humble beginnings in, in the School of Public Health. I was a graduate student. I was seeing cancer patients and there are, there's, a, there's a lot that could be done and all it needs is that that dedication and, and, the, and the therapeutic and, and, and to go with, with what your gut feels is right and, and your heart is asking for. And that's where I started. And I never looked back and I, I want to openly apologize to all my friends that I never called anyone in 10 years and, and my sincere apologies for that. So what I did ever since I started as a faculty or, or started as a fellow in at Emory with, uh, with Sagar Lonial, one, one of the myeloma giants who is very well known for uh, his, his passion towards drug development and therapeutic innovations, bringing all the new drugs to the, to, the, to the patients. And I got so inspired, motivated that I simply emulated him. That's, what, that's all of what, what I did for a, a long time. And things started falling into place and I, I loved what I did. Every day I would wake up to do exactly, to go, uh, go help develop a drug that could help somebody else. So thank you again for giving me this opportunity to, to talk about myself and, and talk about my journey and where exactly, how exactly I ended up in the immunology field and where, how exactly I ended up doing this project for the, for the COVID neutralizing antibodies. So I was an assistant professor in 2011. And when we started, Emory was a, was a small place. Like we were doing, on an average, we were doing close to 175 transplants altogether. That was in 2008. Five years later, as a junior faculty, we were doing 450 transplants. We were, we were seeing half of all the myeloma patients that were seen in the state of Georgia. So I used this growth of the institution for my growth as well simultaneously. And it helped me excel in, 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 in my career of, uh, in the pursuit of my career goals. So this is my team. And to the left that you see is Sagar Lonial, and who's the one who recruited me. And Jonathan Kaufman is the second person that he hired. Dr. Sarma knows them very well. And more importantly, the reason I show up this slide is we see half of the patients in the, in the state of Georgia by nine of us. And here you see Craig Hoffmeister we recruited from Ohio State and Madhav Dodakar, who is a who is a graduate from Ames, went to Mayo Clinic, was in was leading a department in Yale, 
we were able to recruit him to come by to lead our cancer immunology center. So how I got all the opportunities from Sagar, when Madhu came in, he was one of my biggest mentors that it's an unset rule that you like something of what he does and, and you automatically start to work together. And that's how all this, uh, my, my passion in immunology or, or my excellence in, uh, in, in, in the work that I did with the immunology went, went along. So Madhav has been a great mentor, great teacher, and, and he has been a great friend. So in the last year, when we started going for, uh, during the COVID time, so we, we, we basically started with, used to accrue around 70 to 90 patients in a year for clinical trials. So this is purely from a, from a drug development perspective. Anytime when there, when there is new drugs that are, that, that, that are approved for myeloma, every drug we have participated in, and that gives me immense pleasure to, to share with, uh, with how much I enjoyed in the, in, in, in the field to, in the, in the field of this drug development. So we were enrolling 70 to, 70 to 90 patients a year. And March of last year, I was offered to lead the program. So when I took over the reins in 2000, uh, March of 2020 to, to December, we were able to enroll 110 patients in the trials. And we, we did it in the midst of a pandemic. And we had significant federal funding, thanks to Madhav, Larry Boyce, and Mala Shanmugam, who helped us significantly with establishing the, a, a good basic science program and helping with the team science. So what was my role through this process? So I put them in five buckets. The first one that I did was the patient volumes. The second one was the clinical trial enrollment. I'll, I don't take any credit for, for any of those for establishing, but I take credit for maximizing both these buckets. The number three, number four, and number five, the clinical database, the tissue distribution protocols, tissue repositories that are helping us with, with all the federal fundings. These are the ones that I had worked with to build that infrastructure at Emory and especially for the, for the myeloma program. And I, I am proud of that, that aspect in terms of building this infrastructure that has helped us to use the same infrastructure for the COVID, uh, for the COVID grants. So this is a U54 program that was, uh, PI was Dr. Dodapkar, where this, this is a very, uh, this, this is a team science uh, program, a, a, a grant that is given for uh, for only eight centers, centers of excellence, and we are one of those centers. And among these, there are the, what Dr. Dodapkar's project was to to look for the immune responses for the for the COVID nineteen. And there were three disease groups that that we were heading, and three, and I was heading the the myeloma myeloma disease group under this U fifty four program. And that's, that's what enabled us to enroll these patients under, the, uh, under this protocol. And we already have all the data that was existing in the clinical database. And we were able to use the opportunities that we have in terms of the tissue, tissue distribution protocols to collect their blood in a, uh, under a good regulatory uh, protocols. So that was the background of how we ended up having a grant that specifically allowed us to do something that's useful for our patients. So we had a, another grant that we just published. It's a SPORT grant. SPORT is a very coveted, highly prestigious grant that, that our team has just put in on the, on the 25th of September. And here is my entire team. And I'm, I, I could not work any, anywhere else. I am so proud of my team too, and, and the colleagues that I work with. So I changed gears to talk about a small, a, a small premise about the cancer immunology. What did I do specifically in the, in the cancer immunology field in terms of the vaccines that gave me the ability to easily turn over to, to, to the SARS-CoV vaccine responses? So I've been interested in the cancer vaccines for over a decade. So uh, almost a decade ago, we did have the PVX410, this is developed by a company called Oncopap. 
And cancer vaccines are, are, are very challenging. It's, it's very elusive in a, in, in a way that finding the right tumor associated ant antigen is, 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 is a challenge. Like there should be a, a lot of characteristics that this antigen should have. At the same time, find there, there are lots of what time, what is the antigen load that you're looking for? What exactly is the time for this vaccination? You cannot be uh, pursuing a, a vaccine trial in somebody that has a reproduction disease. It has to be a quiescent disease. And if that quiescent disease, you're, you're, you're exploring a vaccine, is it the right time that would, that would mount that right immune response is, is the biggest challenge. So in myeloma, what we have is a precursor condition called the smoldering multiple myeloma and the MGAS. I always say that this, it's from MGAS to smoldering multiple myeloma to, to multiple myeloma, it's a one-way street. It, it, it progresses as the clone evolves over time. And we use the opportunity to, to the space where of the smoldering multiple myeloma to use a cancer vaccine to evaluate for the immune responses to alter the natural history of the disease to prevent the progression. So that's where this PVX410 comes into play. It's a tetrapeptide vaccine. We use three antigens. These are ubiquitously uh, expressed in most myeloma cells or plasma cells. So uh, XPP1, CD138, and CS1. And our goal of treating the PVX410 is to induce immunity against the myeloma cells by selectively stimulating the tumor-associated antigen-specific cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So the schema is very simple. This is one of the first in human studies that I had done. Week one, we were giving a, the lowest dose for the safety to be established. So the first three patients got three milligrams per kilogram and went on to receive the uh, uh, dose expansion to uh, 10 milligram per kilogram in the next seven patients. So cohort one is with vaccine alone. And cohort two, we use vaccine in combination with lenalidomide. Lenalidomide is a, is a myeloma drug that we use on a daily basis. So it is a thalidomide analog, has a bad history in terms of the focomilias associated with these, uh, with, with, the, with the thalidomide, uh, thalidomide and analogs back in the 1960s. And we found the, the role of the specific immunomodulatory agents in the 2000s to see that it is helping and it is helping in control of uh, the myeloma cell proliferation. So now it is a part, of it, it's a huge part of the myeloma uh, treatment algorithms. It's a backbone of the myeloma treatments. We use it every day. And this is one of the drugs that is used in the maintenance setting. So vaccine plus lenalidomide, lenalidomide was given for three months. This is smoldering multiple myeloma patients and vaccine was given every two weeks, similar to cohort one. And we were looking for the vaccine responses at three months. So here is how the lenalidomide works. Like it is a cerebellum binding agent. Once it binds to a cerebellum, it has direct tumorcidal effects as well as a immunomodulatory effects, acts by enhancing the NK cells, increasing the interferon gamma secretion, IL-2 secretion, also has some direct tumor tumorcidal effects. All of these are mediated by the transcription factors, the degradation of the ICROS and ELOS. So looking at the immune responses, so we specifically saw in the cohort one, which is to the left panel, you see that the, the, the blue columns, you see a, at, the, at the visit two to visit four to visit six, there is a, almost a two-fold increase with the vaccination. So we looked at the tetramers, we looked at the interferon gamma, these are the functional T cell assays, we looked at the IL-2 production. All of these are favoring, or we are seeing a, an enhancement after the vaccine uh, administration. So now with the addition of lenalidomide, what we are seeing is a significant enhancement or augmentation of these responses compared to what you saw with the vaccine as a single agent. So this is what we published back in 2018, like it's seven years after we started, we, we, uh, after we started the trial, we published these results, gained a lot of enthusiasm. And we certainly have a lot, lot in the ways of developing these drugs, but helped me significantly in the, in the field of immunology, trying to understand more about the immune responses. 
So we also uh, I also participated in what's called a dendritic cell dendritic cell fusion vaccine trials. So again, for the same reasons that we talked about, what is the optimal time for a vaccine administration for a disease control? So we identified in this specific trial, post-transplant, after transplant, when the disease burden is the lowest at this point, you certainly can examine the usage of having a vaccine which is, and the, the question that came in here was, how should we deliver the vaccine? There are several types of vaccines, the idiotypic vaccines, dendritic cell fusion vaccines, but the, the group from Dana Farber and the group from Beth Israel uh, Deacons, uh, David Avigan's group basically came in with the dendritic cell fusion vaccine where we, we all understand that dendritic cells are the uh, best antigen or the most efficient antigen presenting cells and using the tumor cells to fuse with the dendritic cell. And this is only done in 18 specialized centers across the country. And this is once the vaccine is made, the patient goes on to get randomized to one of these three arms and lenalidomide alone, which is a control arm, lenalidomide plus GMCSF, which, which we are using as an adjuvant to enhance these responses, and are going with vaccine plus GMCSF and lenalidomide. These results are uh, highly awaited. We, are, we, we probably have them presented at transplant and cellular therapies in February of 20, uh, 2022. So it's a, it's a nice experience in terms of the immunology field as, as, as we went on. So as I alluded to before, the NIH has identified eight different centers and given grants for, for eight different U54 projects. And one of them is uh, the PI is Madhav along with Ignacio Sands and looking at the immune regulation of COVID-19 infection in cancer and autoimmunity. So Changing gears, we, we're talking about specifically about COVID-19, not in hematological ma uh, malignancies, but specifically in the COVID-19. The, the COVID-19 genome encodes four different structural proteins. The spike protein, the envelope, membrane, and the nucleic capsid. So one has to understand if you're looking for a nucleic capsid antibody, it is only present when there is an active infection or when there's an asymptomatic infection, it cannot be obtained through a vaccine. So this is uh, the antibodies that we looked, uh, as, as, as I'll allude to as, as, as we go, we also looked for the nucleic capsid antibody to look for the responses specifically among those patients who had a COVID, COVID prior and still got the vaccine and how, how they fared in terms of the neutralization antibodies as well. So the virus penetrates through the viral S protein to the ACE2 receptors that are present mainly in the oral mucosal epithelial cells and the lung alveolar cells and some other uh, human tissues as well. So taking a step back, if you're looking at a vaccine response, what do you specifically look for? So this is the same thing the FDA looks for in terms of the guidance. When Pfizer and Moderna and j, &J everyone presented their data, they had to present exactly all these aspects of the responses in, uh, for an approval, for a vaccine approval. So the first one is the cellular responses, CD8 positive or CD4 T cell activation responses. The next one is the humoral responses. You're specifically looking for the specific antigen specific responses, antibody generation from that specific antigen. The functional responses, this is the trickier part. So they should be able to induce the neutralization antibody production. So how do you check that? So because the conventional way of how we normally check is using a live virus, not easy. It is time consuming, it is burdensome, and it, it, it only can be done in a, in a biosafety lab three, which is a, a highly protective environment. And it has to be counted manually, takes time, takes days. This is not an easy process. So the easiest way that people do is using a pseudovirus neutralization assay, where you use a wild type coronavirus and wild type, and you look for a measure. And this, these come as readily usable kits and some of these commercial kits are available and they can be easily used. 
and it only takes a couple of hours to do these tests. Last but not the least, which is uh, the surrogate virus neutralization assay. This test uses the, the RBD, the receptor binding domain, as well as the ACE2 receptor, the they extract them and specifically look for, uh, look, at, uh, look for that as a surrogate for the viral neutralization. So this is much more easier, but if you look at the gold standard, the gold standard always goes back to the conventional live virus neutralization assays. So now talking about COVID and the hematological malignancies, it is extremely important to understand that COVID, that patients with hematological malignancies acquiring COVID have a high mortality. The mortality is in the range of around 30% among patients who are hospitalized. So one in three people don't make it out of the hospital. Why, did, why is that very different compared to the others? So the hematological malignancies usually put their, the immune system, it's a, it's a highly dysfunctional immune system with the dysfunctional B cells, dysfunctional T cells. And these are the ones that are really important to protect us from the virus. And unfortunately, it's a, it's a dysfunctional system that exists in these patients. Not only that, the second point that comes in here is the treatments that we use for all these hematological malignancies do exactly uh, are, are targeting the B cells. So the chemotherapy that we use, the anti-CD20 antibodies like rituximab, anti-CD38 antibodies like daratumumab, the BTK inhibitors that we use for Waldenstrom's so some low-grade myelomas, stem cell transplantation, chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapies. This is a, this is a new kid on the block. We did have an, an approval in myeloma five months ago. This specifically, this cellular therapy targets uh, a antigen on the B cell here in, in myeloma, we are using the B cell maturation antigen here. So the T cells are unable to recognize the myeloma cell. So the, an, an, op, an option is to get those T cells and engineer them to express a synthetic receptor to identify the BCMA and make an army of these T cells in vitro and introduce into the patient to get the desired response. And this has shown clinically to be beneficial among patients and, and it was approved for lymphoma and ALL almost two years ago and in myeloma five months ago. So these again are targeting the B cell therapies, uh, targeting the B cells, making these patients extremely vulnerable. So, now, if you look at this cartoon, what you see on red is depicting what CLL is. What you see in green is depicting what, depicting what non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What you see in brown is depicting myeloma. So the seroconversion rates among patients that are vaccinated range from almost 30% to 70% in the CLL patients. The same thing applies to the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma where the seroconversion rates are very, very low. In myeloma, you don't see those seroconversion rates to be as low, but they're very low compared to the healthy controls here. So again, these go back to the same principles that we talked about. All these are B-cell malignancies and the treatments that we use, again, are B-cell directed. So what are the ones, that, what are the hematological malignancies that do not have the same kind of an impact? You see on the top, AML, MDS, and CML, these are myeloid neoplasms. We don't use any of the B cell directed therapies. And these certainly have the same kind of a zero conversion rates as the, as, as the healthy controls. So in the same lines, the Greek group started with looking just at the myeloma patients. Anybody that has a plasma cell dyscrasia, plasma cells are the ones that make the antibodies. So all the humoral immunity is basically di uh, directed by the, the, the plasma cells or the, or the B cells. So now a malignancy involving a plasma cell could be the perfect prototype to look at the specific responses. So one of the main reasons why the Greek group did this was uh, to look at the neutralizing antibodies. So they took 276 patients and myeloma patients accounted for 213 of them. Small ring and MGAS patients accounted for close to 50 patients. And these are the precursor states that are not needing treatment. So as, as, as you see, this is, the, this is the neutralization antibodies. And this is day one 
among everyone, the myeloma, MGUS, and the smoldering myeloma patients. There are 276 patients altogether, and these are almost their, their initial assay is similar to what you find with the healthy controls. Now, three weeks later, after day one, you see that the median has increased significantly here for, for, the, for the plasma cell dyscrasia group, but not as much as the healthy control immune response. So now at day 50, the median has significantly increased again compared to day 22 among the myeloma patients, but nowhere closer to what you see for the healthy controls. So this is all plasma cell discretions put together. The, the neutralizing antibodies did not, uh, were nowhere closer to what the healthy controls looked like. So how about you split them by the myeloma versus smoldering multiple myeloma and MGUS. So again, here, the myeloma is depicted in blue and MGUS is depicted in purple. And at day 22, the MGUS patients had better response compared to the myeloma and small to multiple myeloma had a response that is intermediate. And similarly, when you see here at day 50, the MGUS patients had responses almost similar to what you see with the healthy controls. And compared to the myeloma patients, they did not have the neutralization uh, that clinically relevant uh, neutralization. So now the next question that they asked is, so how do we differentiate these patients if they consider 30% inhibition as the, as the cutoff? How do you, how, what, is, what are the different, different features that you see between this group and the group that really was positive? They called negative as less than 30% and positive as 50%. We talked about the neutralization assays and this group used a surrogate neutralization assay which is probably the, the least wanted assay, but clearly they were making a point and that was a easily available approach. And they were able to show that specifically in the myeloma patients, the neutralization is significantly lesser. So when, the, when they differentiated which group are the ones that, that had a higher response and what you see is lenalidomide maintenance, similar to what we had seen in, 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 in the prior trial that I discussed, as well as observation had the same kind of a neutralization compared to the, uh, compared to the low neutralization. So patients who did not get the neutralization, again, the CD38 antibodies, there are two MEB monotherapy, 9.2% versus 1.7%. And as you see the the other combinations like the PI-based combinations, this is proteasome inhibitor combinations. And there are clearly, this data is al allowing us to help us to create that clinical phenotype, the person that is that will not have a neutralization antibody. So now with that background, what we try to do is try to find what are the determinants of neutralizing antibody with a live virus assay, with a live, uh, with a neutralizing, with a live virus, as well as a pseudovirus neutralization assay. And we took the 238 sample, uh, patient samples using the infrastructure that I described previously. So again, why do we need to do this? Because we specifically know that vaccine-induced neutralizing antibodies play a crucial role in the protection from uh, COVID-19. And the ability of these vaccine-induced and vaccine -induced antibodies to neutralize the SARS-CoV-2 and its variants is almost not described at all at this point. So, especially in the, in the, in the patients with uh, hematological malignancies. So in our data set of 238 patients, we had the RBD antibodies detected in 87% of the patients. 13% of them did not have any detectable RBD antibodies. So now among these, so the first test is RBD. We did the neutralization assay. It is almost shocking to us to see only half of the patients were, uh, were able to have a neutralization antibody. So 47, 46% of these patients did not have a neutralization antibody. Now, one thing that we talked about before was the nucleocapsid. Nucleocapsid was only seen among the patients 
who had a COVID, right? None of these patients that we enrolled on this trial had COVID, was diagnosed with COVID. But when you see the nucleic acid antibody was seen in 33 of them, which specifically means that these patients have asymptomatic disease. They did not even know that they had an infection because of all the background that I gave in terms of how dysfunctional their immune system is. So now asymptomatic infections are extremely common. 15% of the patients had this. Now, if you look at the antibody responses, 100% of these people had an antibody response. So these are the patients that had COVID, that had a vaccine, that had a 100% antibody response. Not surprising. But what is surprising is the neutralizing antibody here, only 70% of them had a neutralizing antibody, which means these 30% of these patients that are here have a chance for a reinfection with COVID. So a very high number, these numbers are extremely surprising to us, but we knew going in that this is what we're going to find. But I'll talk about more in more detail about what, what our plan for these uh, people would be. But as we, as we go on with looking at the RBD antibody titers at week one, uh, week one and two, this is a baseline. This is where we collected the initial sample after the vaccination. And when, when the patients get the dose two, around week two after dose two is when they had the peak titers. And around month three, that's the average time after dose two is when they started having these vaccine titers dropping down. The same thing was seen among patients with the neutralization assay, among the RBD assay, and also the patients that really were COVID negative and COVID positive you're seeing a higher responses in COVID positive patients. I'm calling them COVID positive, but these are nuclear capsule positive patients. These were responses were higher compared to the others, but exactly the same pattern that you're seeing that these responses are dropping down. They're peaking at two, two weeks after the dose two and dropping down at three months after dose two. So this is exactly a representation of what, what I talked about how in, in terms of the titers they're going higher, that's the average number, and the titer drops down at three months after the second dose. So now correlating the antibodies with the neutralization antibodies, there's a strong correlation. As you can see, the R is 0.8. There's a very strong correlation, but what is surprising is these red dots. So having a vigorous antibody response, when you give a vaccine, having a vigorous antibody response is not enough to have a neutralizing antibody. These patients had, a, had greater than 10 to the power of three in here uh, who had zero neutralization. Looking at the other way, if a patient has, has a neutralization positive, how many of them were RBD negative? I can only see one patient here. And this patient is not strongly neutralization positive as well. So clearly we need, alternative strategies to improvise on how to improve this neutralization. So we talked about going on for the, the live virus neutralization assays. We did the live virus neutralization assays at Emory. And what we had seen among this is uh, induction of the vaccine-induced neutralization antibodies with the Wuhan virus, the original virus, as well as the Delta variant. And this Delta variant, we're clearly seeing that there is a 2.1 lesser, 2.14 lesser induction of vaccine induced uh, neutralization antibodies compared to the original virus strain. We looked at the correlation between, because we only did it in 45 patients, it's a small subset of patients. And we looked at the correlation between our pseudovirus neutralization assay, as well as the live virus neutralization assay for the Wuhan virus, as well as the Delta virus. And you can see the R numbers at 0 0.9196. These are very, very strongly correlated. So moving on to identify the clinical determinants. So now, now that we know what was happening immunologically, who is the right clinical phenotype of the person that you want to be really careful about, or you, you have the increased vigilance for this patient. So here is what we discussed earlier. The RBD positivity was in 87%. The neutralization positivity was in 53%. And again, the nucleic acid antibody positivity was in around 15% patients. So 
looking very closely, one thing that really surprised me is this aspect. If you look at the, the race, African-Americans had an 89% RBD positivity. So, and whites had 85% RBD positivity. This is the antibody. Now, neutralization antibodies are significantly different. When African-Americans receive the vaccine, they have a higher rate, almost 15% higher rate of neutralized, having a neutralizing antibody compared to the whites. This has been described in the previous literature, but we, we hardly know why it is so different, especially by the race. So this is something that we really want to delve into in the future as well. So more importantly, as you go down to start looking at the clinically or the statistically significant uh, variables that, that, are, that are really playing a role here, the quantitative IgG of less than 400, the plasma cells make the antibodies and all the myeloma treatments are directed towards, uh, towards treating a plasma cell or hitting the plasma cell. And most of, it's not uncommon to see these patients to have hypogamma globulinemia. So which is defined as, so in colloquial terms, I would say 700 is the cutoff. And we looked at two cutoffs at 400 and 700. And what we're clearly able to, able to see is patients that had lower IgG of less than 400, their neutralization is 39%. And if they're greater than 400, it is 58.3%. If you look at the quantitative IgGs, this is again, uh, greater than 700, it is 63%. This is almost similar to what the entire cohort looks like. So other things of interest, when we started to look a little closely, lines of therapy is not surprising. The more heavily the patient is pretreated, the lesser the chance for them to have the neutralization antibody as well as the RPD antibody to mount any immune response. So more than two lines of therapy, only 71% had an RBD positivity compared to 93% among patients who are less treated. And the same number supply here for the NAV, 35% versus 60%. If you look closely, the last one is the vaccine. It's very interesting when we start looking at uh, the Pfizer versus Moderna. So both of them, and the last one where only four patients received was the J&J. So Pfizer had 86% RBD positivity. Moderna had 91% RBD positivity. But when it comes to neutralization, mRNA Moderna is highly inducing the neutralization antibodies. So we started to look for what could be the reasons, potential reasons for uh, this specific increase in, in, in the neutralization antibodies with, with Moderna. And the dose potentially has a role. There's a timing difference between both of these. At this, at this time, it is too early and the, and the sample size is too small to have a, a, a strong conclusion, but clearly it, it is dose dependent is what I believe in. So looking at the impact of treatment for on the RBD and the, and the neutralization antibodies, we had seen the BCL2 inhibitors, which are which have been in use again. These these are basal uh, targeted treatments. The anti-BCMA antibody drug conjugates. The what we are seeing is the CD38 antibodies. All of these exactly similar to what we had seen previously from from the others experience is showing that all these treatments could impact the neutralization antibodies. So again, similar to what we what we talked about earlier, the lenalidomide maintenance, the maintenance part we saw in my cancer vaccine trial and the Greek trial. And again, in our data set, this is exactly what, what is shown. The patients who are in len maintenance had 100% RBD positivity and 66% of these patients had neutralization antibodies, which is again, Surprising because a year ago we were asking patients to stop off their maintenance as we're afraid that could dampen their immune responses. And this is an eye opener for us to say that what we were thinking was wrong. Looking again at the predictors for NAB responses, similar to what we had talked about on the univariate analysis, all of what I discussed before have popped up statistically significant. So with this information, we were able to create that right phenotype to identify who's the, who's the person that 
potentially we could we could intervene in terms of a higher dose vaccine or in terms of a uh, heterologous vaccine or in terms of trying to see who has the highest uh, highest chance for not having that neutralization antibody. So again, going back to the, the theme, the quantification of a spike protein may not correctly measure the protection to the virus. And the levels of neutralization, neutralizing antibodies at one to two weeks after the vaccination were as low as 50%. And this is very different compared to the healthy donors or the healthy controls that, that were reported. And these numbers are way higher than what we see in the B-cell malignancy population. So our data illustrates the importance of monitoring these neutralizing antibodies and the SARS-CoV-2 exposure by the nuclear capsids when evaluating the immunogenicity of vaccines in these patients. So we, this, can, this discussion can go on forever, but which vaccine is a, is a, is a discussion that, that will come and that will continue to go on. And based on our data, uh, the, what, we sub, what we see is the choice of mRNA-1273 or the Moderna as a preferred initial vaccine in the patient population that I described earlier. So for the same reasons that I alluded to before, we may not know the exact reason, but the dose, there is a significant dose difference in, in terms of the density between the Pfizer and the Moderna, and that potentially could be the reason and there are both these companies are doing higher dose vaccination trials in the past. And this is not a new phenomenon. So if you look in the, in the vaccine history, say for example, influenza history. So cancer patients or the patients with hematological malignancies do not mount the same kind of a influenza response like a healthy control. So giving three doses instead of one, giving a higher dose instead of one, all these trials have been ongoing for a while. So this is no different than any of those trials. And potentially the higher dosing uh, as well as a booster is going to allow us to get more insight into this aspect. So one thing is very important, uh, it's despite the underlying immune, immune parasites. So the plasma cells are not making the antibodies as they're supposed to. The patients with prior SARS-CoV-2 exposure who were able to produce the nuclear capsid antibodies also achieved the high levels of neutralizing antibodies. These are 70% following the vaccination. So, but again, 30% of them did not make that vaccine, which, which makes it 30% of them did not make the neutralizing antibody, which makes them highly susceptible for a subsequent infection. So again, the data that I presented support the current recommendation to pursue vaccination, even in patients with prior SARS-CoV-2 exposure and testing for the booster vaccinations as, as well as a cocktail with heterologous high-dose boosters in this population is warranted. So one can ask, why don't we measure T-cell responses in, in, in everyone? The problem is these are extremely variable and there is data that is sparse and they, they, it is moving everywhere. So the patients with hematologic malignancies who survived COVID, they had, there was a study that, that they looked at showing high, low levels of antibodies, but they had a robust CD8 positive cytotoxic T cell response. So when they look more closely, the helper T cells were in these patients were almost very, very low. And you, you could have a robust response, but could these responses last much longer for the, the memory responses, which are, which are driven by, this, uh, the, by the helper cells and could this be uh, could this be something that potentially uh, that potentially is a concern for uh, for us? So, in conclusion, the the patients that have a good antibody response that have a neutralization that did not have a neutralization could serve as reservoirs for hosting the virus and allowing that virus to change. So this virus is not going anywhere. It is going to stay with us. And potentially we're looking for more and more variants. And, and you, you have seen clearly what the patient population is. So how do we tackle a situation like this? Increasing the research testing of the COVID-19 vaccine formulations, looking for all the doses, frequent intervals, higher dosings, 
repeat rounds of immunizations, heterologous boostings, all these are, are ways to increase the rates of seroconversions. But which is the optimal way? I don't think anyone knows the answer to that question. So how about using the passive immunity, immunity prophylaxis? So identifying those high-risk patients has an advantage. So these are the ones that potentially can benefit from increased vigilance, administration of the neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, convalescent serum or serum from vaccinated people. So patients on D-cell therapies seem to be at the highest risk and would require increased surveillance and strategies to vaccinate everyone in the family around to increase the herd immunity is, is definitely something that should be considered for, uh, for the entire good of the entire community. So with that, I'll stop. I, I don't know if I ran over time. My apologies for that. Yeah, you did not go over time. You did not. But uh, before Dr. Sarma asks the questions, I'm dying to ask you a question. Yes, Dr. Karam. I am really struck by this infor information about dose. For example, five, six months ago, we were begging people to take the shots. And then came the discussion regarding who should get the third shot, not the booster, the third shot. People at greater risk, hematologic malignancies, immunosuppressed, etc. Now the discussion is about booster, six months, seven months, eight months. But I was caught blindsided by discussion about dose. So what is the information regarding dose for, for example, influenza, influenza vaccine or Shingrix vaccine, for example, how did we miss this, that dose would make a difference? Because two weeks ago, Sridhar Chilimuri was saying, you have an obese patient, they have a skinny little needle, it doesn't even go deep enough. Dose also reflects how much dose is delivered into the muscle rather than the big subcutaneous tissue. So I was curious about, was this something that did not think through and what are the risks and benefits? Should we have given a bigger dose all along? What are the risks? So great question, Dr. Karam. So unfortunately, the, having been in the, in, in the drug development, it, it is a uncharted field. So nobody knows what the starting dose would be at the, at, at the, at the first time. And here we're in an emergency when, when all these drugs initially started. So the Moderna and the Pfizer, both of them, it is a new technology that they never worked with. This is the first ever time that they're working with. We don't know what a dose is. The first thing that we're looking at as, is the safety. We're not looking at the efficacy at the first place. So the safety, when the safety dosing is confirmed, then you go for the efficacy dosing. So these are the step number two that would be coming in down the line. So the modelings that help us with the dosing are still models. They're not humans. So if I can, if I have to say the reason why a, a low dose is always preferred is exactly for the, for the provision of the safety with this smaller dosing that provides a benchmark against which the higher doses is, is uh, compared against. I see. Thank you. So, so there, are uh, many, there are many I'm 300 on. founders in my neighborhood. So should they get a long needle or a bigger dose? Both. So I would not play with the dose at this time. The approved dose is what, 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 what I would go with. The only place where I would go with a higher dose is only as a part of a clinical trial where there is extra monitoring and where there is frequent visits. Ravi, Ramohan, yes. Ramohan, let me add. Uh, so Pfizer CEO clearly said that they made a conscious decision to stay with the 30 micrograms per dose uh, when they came up with the uh, dose calculation because they had optimum response and they wanted to make sure it is safe, like Ajay mentioned. Moderna never, never did anything. This was their first product. So they went with the higher dose. 
okay it turned out the safety wise they were okay there is a there is something called a moderna reaction where you get lot more local re- reactions but they went with the 100 microgram dose in fact when they are now applying to the fda for the booster they are actually give submitting clinical trials on the 50 microgram dose that they are using for the booster okay so if you are looking at the third dose for example in kidney transplant patients where you give the third dose at the end of 28 days after the second dose for pfizer you still give the 30 micrograms and i was going to ask ajay if we give a third dose moderna should you be giving 100 microgram dose or take their booster 50 how will you decide how to give the third dose that's a, this is a great question i, I think i've seen some preliminary data on the boosters the booster responses are almost like going tenfold right so the responses are too high so right. if if you're looking for so probably one of the conscious decision coming from moderna is exactly for the same reason for a booster you may not need the full dose going with half the dose is probably what would be right. beneficial in right. terms of the safety it works as well so anyway it's really amazing they got it right in terms of efficacy and one of the experienced company pfizer which has seen this for decades went for safety moderna was the first dose so they went with the higher one they said we'll see and they both turned out to be good and then uh, of course the this is where we are in the dilemma right now your talk is so excellent it is way above what any ordinary even hematology oncologists understand but just an incredible amount of volume of work and research in a short period of time you know you guys have a great team working there and uh, how do you translate this for example this type of uh, knowledge into other transplant patients the number one transplantation is kidney transplantation is any of the information you're presenting uh can it be extrapolated to the renal transplant area either through the emery work or anywhere else is there anything that you can tell us because that's where the number one issues are kidney transplant patients so what we are seeing i call this as a as a prototype for only only because these are the patients that clearly reflects any immune suppressed patient So that at a baseline, a myeloma patient or a CLL patient is so immune suppressed, you know it more than me, Dr. Sarma, in terms of how immune suppressed they are and how, how susceptible they are to infections. So clearly what we saw in this patient population can be applied to any immune suppressive states, which brings to another good point. So we talked about the U54 mechanism involving different labs and, and and the core groups and everything that we got the grant in right so the what we what was very interesting was on the on these calls there was there was a obgyn research personnel that was there and they talked about the same exact things that we are seeing in pregnant women so high rates of rbd positivity low rates of neutralization antibodies exactly similar to 50% or 55% of what we are seeing it is a nature's induced Im- immune suppressive state to accept a graft and we 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 don't know what what strategies to to use for them except to say to get vaccinated and to avoid any exposures and try to, trying to be vigilant for these patients Oh, the doctors yeah. smiles. They were, they did not take the pregnant women, uh, so yeah. they, then they had to rush in and try to get the safety data. Doctor Naveen has a question. Sir, uh, hello everyone, sir. Uh, congratulations, uh, Doctor Ajay Noka. Like Doctor Ravi Sharma, sir said. it is way above uh, the talk is way above the normal regular audience sir and uh, dr ajay noka uh, thank you for sharing good news to all the hematological patients and hematological malignancy patients you have said that they are at least not uh, bad as compared to healthy controls uh, that is some good news sir and another observation is uh, i think moderna has the first positive point uh, 
uh, in uh, in all respects uh, uh, compared to pfizer sir only in with regard to your hematological malignancies uh, they produce a better antibodies and i think uh, like rav sharma sir said the higher dosing may be responsible for that sir uh, and uh, another observation from our indian perspective side is once again who said uh, no to our bharat biotech to covax sir they have to wait for a while before getting uh, uh, clearance uh, world over and congratulations to all of you sir for uh, getting a new oral pill for uh, covid for mild to moderate disease from merck sir most probably they will submit data today or tomorrow to fda last night also i heard anthony fossi and fda commissioner saying speaking very very high about this merck oral pill sir congratulations to all of you and for the end again the bad news for us indians regarding booster doses icmr says it's one year before they get before the antibodies wane off and don't think about booster dose or third dose for us indians sir that is about icmr regarding third dose for us indians sir thank you sir thank you once again and congratulations sir dr ajay nonka for the wonderful presentation thank you for the opportunity uh dr ramesh chandra has a question go ahead please uh sir that was a wonderful presentation uh can you hear me sir yes, yes yeah yeah thank you sir that was a wonderful presentation uh actually some are talking about a third dose and some are talking in terms of booster dose i just wanted to find a <laughs> difference between the two so what is exactly is required for those immunosuppressed for those elderly uh what is exactly required is a third dose or booster dose booster dose and i want to know the difference between the two so it these are semantics i don't see there is a uh, there is any difference between a third dose and a booster dose so so so, so i mean so so there's no difference between the third dose or the booster dose booster dose both are the same so the, the dosing is slightly different in terms of what is approved okay so the dosing is the same as the first and second dose or it's a higher or lower so the approval so the approval for pfizer is exactly the same only for one reason because it's a, it is a lower dose so the what dr ravi sharma talked about earlier was so the dose of moderna was way higher even to begin with so those patients for the booster they went on with 50% of their dosing they went for a fda approval for 50% of their dosing but uh, ajay is it not correct if somebody gets a first dose in january second dose in february but if they are immunosuppressed myeloma patient immunocompromised they will get a third shot in march and 6 7 months later they get a booster should we not be making the distinction between third shot and booster for public education so right now it is not recommended that way so right now the booster the third dose is not recommended for any of these so if, if you want to give it that that is outside of what what clinically indicated uh, schedule is so you you're making a great point if if somebody is getting a booster at a wrong time should that be called as a as a as a dose instead of a booster a booster is to boost the immune responses and the data that we had seen was these responses start to decline after the third month or fourth month we didn't know that this is what 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 is going to happen but we are clearly seeing these responses dropping down and that is the right time probably for a booster but you could but help that- us you could help us so that we could tell people the shot in the march is a third shot and the shot in october is a booster i agree with that okay if if it's said sir, sir kairam sir kairam sir this is what exactly is dr sridhar sirmuri clarified regarding this third dose and booster dose sir what the kairam sir exactly said this is what uh, dr sridhar sirmuli sir clarified regarding third dose and booster dose a while earlier last month uh, speech he said the same thing sir Uh, Naveen Garu, Naveen Garu, I regularly attend the Chilimuri Temple every week. You got that, Alada? 
and then sir he, he said the same thing like what you said sir no no i'm just telling you i'm copying chilimuri what he said but i just used the example january february march to distinguish october so that we have clarity because ramesh chandra asked a good question what is the third shot what is the booster but in a conference like this with 110 people who will then go and talk to other people i thought dr nuka might help us to clarify the terminology but there is some issue regarding those so um, okay. that that's why we, i was i did not want to belabor the point but i think okay. i understand uh, the booster thank you uh, there is another question in the chat box let's see who that is oh that's you um dr sharma you have other questions are um dr sudhakar yeah i don't want to hog the mic so i will let anybody else to speak i appreciate all of you okay dr sharma you you wanted to know about the molnu parivar and thank you for reminding me of that that's that is an, an original product from from memory yeah, that's um, right. yeah so it was similar to the, the the same group that did the hepatitis c drugs so are the ones that created the molnupiravir and mm. they have a tie tie up with a pharmaceutical company not with mark but there is another Miami. one called the ridgeback like so, this Miami world yeah yeah I mean, yeah <laughs> so they they they're very good it's led by a, led by a physician and it's a it is somebody who's a entrepreneur who who created the, the ridgeback ridgeback farms pharmaceuticals so they the tie up with them was to for the drug development and we participated in these trials i uh, not me not being an infectious disease person so i never got a chance to look at the 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 covid-19 patients and and the how their enrollment was and what the results were but the results are very informative from what the public domain is in terms of the 50% reduction and i'm hoping for an approval for an oral, oral pill and thank you for reminding me that Okay, wonderful. I, I have a related question. This drug, do you think it would have any prophylactic role at a smaller dose, smaller dose given weekly, et cetera, in at-risk people? It potentially could be. So I, I think the, the way that I'm seeing this is among the patients that are exposed, say for example, a, a wife in the, at home got covid the husband is at the highest risk those are the people the those probably are the highest at risk patients so if, if i have to design a trial in terms of which which are the where exactly would i place this drug in the future that is the population that i'd be looking at this drug is completely new to me as of last week what is the toxicity or side effect spectrum so i'm not completely aware about that so but i the safety is extremely extremely uh, good on the paper it seems uh dr ramesh chandra your hand is still up you have another question yes sir yeah yeah actually i mean healthcare workers they should take a third dose, third dose. i mean just like uh, any other immunosuppressed so, healthcare workers third dose that's a good question the third dose or the booster dose like the, like uh, the recommendations advice or uh... no no so, uh, ramesh participants if you call the booster dose it should be a booster yeah. dose no whatever it is Are the healthcare workers advised to take the third one or not? So we are one of the high risk people, and we got a nod from the FDA for the school teachers and the healthcare workers uh, to get the booster dose. Like that is how long? How long after the second dose? It is six months after the second dose for Pfizer. Okay. Any information like with COVID shield or Covaxin? any any recommendations regarding that 
because we have covid shield and covax in india so any is it the same 6 months after the second dose of covid shield also so i don't know a lot about the about the studies that were done so i i'm sorry about my limited knowledge knowledge with the covid shield it's okay sir it's okay thank you very much thank okay. you navin navin just said the uh, icmr said it is one year no no third dose uh, no booster dose in india that's what he was just saying and uh, so <laughs> I okay, got sir. my third dose, booster dose, about two weeks ago. As soon as they said healthcare workers can get, we went and got in my in my hospital. They gave it to us. Uh, all my uh, oncology nursing staff in the chemotherapy area, they all got their third dose. Very nice. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the information. Thank you. Navin yeah. stands the entire COVID landscape in India. So for today, we'll take his word. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I have a question, uh, Dr. Murka. Uh, do you advise getting the antibody titers done by the healthcare workers, maybe after five or six months, to know whether the antibodies are really falling before taking a booster, if you have facility? My advice is yes for checking that checking the titers. So the whether to get the booster or not should not be dependent on falling titers. so because these responses will eventually wane and by not taking it at the at the at the time at the prescribed time we probably we probably are asking for trouble dr nuka uh, that was an excellent exposition a very very current knowledge on Uh, vaccine responses antibodies and uh, how we should keep our ears open for what will come down the pipe i appreciate uh, the attention to detail and your scholarship so in these kind of meetings much can be learned although i didn't completely understand everything you said in the first 20 minutes but then i improved my hearing capacity so thank you very much this was a very good for me so doctor uh, you usually at this time we ask dr sudhakar what's going on in india vaccination is still picking up and how is visakhapatnam sir yeah uh, thank you ram mohan and uh, vaccination is uh, uh, steadily progressing in uh, andhra pradesh as well as in india and we are doing almost uh, 100000 doses every day Uh, at least on an alternate day in uh, Vishakhapatnam, Vishakhapatnam district. So that translates into a million doses per day in the entire uh, Andhra Pradesh. I think we are close to 80 percent of um, vaccination, at least one dose, and about 40 percent of the people have completed both the doses. So the as uh, Navin said, the uh, the booster dose has not come into picture as yet. and uh, not even for the healthcare workers unlike what we see in the united states so that's the present scenario here in india and um, i'm glad that uh, the uh, the supplies of vaccine has become they are more consistent nowadays compared to what we have seen about a month or two back you know so that's a uh, good news for all of us so nowadays the vaccine hesitancy is not as much as we usually uh, we thought of earlier uh people are coming forward uh, rather we have a system here wherein uh, you have the ward volunteer and ward secretariat system you have the uh, demographic data available with this government people go and uh, pursue individuals to get vaccinated there is not much resistance and people are having the vaccinations uh, done so that's from um, uh, the andhra pradesh and the uh in india how are you doing with vaccinating women and pregnant women in particular yeah yeah it's it's being done uh, regularly you know there's no difference between the general public and the pregnant women they're also taking very good thank you well if there are no other questions from the audience i see one more in the chat box 
uh, uh, Dr. Naveen telling us India is preparing to export vaccines from this month again. God bless India. So uh, at this point, I will close the evening. Next uh, Saturday. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Let, let me make a few comments before you complete. Yeah, yeah go ahead. No, no, I was just going to announce that uh, Prasad Chalasani will speak next Saturday on cardiac and cardiovascular catastrophes in COVID. And also yeah. I asked him to talk about long COVID as it affects the heart and the cardiovascular system. Yeah, uh, that would be very interesting. Yeah, before I wind up this particular session, I wish to thank Dr. Ajay Nuka very much. I'm so glad to see his ID card of 1994, he 1994 batch. And he was a house agent, he was given that particular badge of Kinjali Hospital. And I'm very glad that he's preserving even today. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ajay, for having come here and uh, shared your expertise. Like Dr. Ramohan said, it was very scholarly. And um, we wish to listen to you more often. I mean, uh, not sooner but definitely over a period of time with more information and advances uh, as they happen in the field of uh, immunology. And um, uh, thank you once again. And thank you, Ramohan, for so ably conducting this meeting and moderating the session. My special thanks to Dr. Uh, Ravi Sharma for introducing uh, Ajay as well as contributing uh, to the discussion that we had this evening. And uh, thank you all very much. With that note, we close the session here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ajay. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.